We came to this land, we came to this place, where this year there is a presence of an awakened force. We are here because we have a goal, and every one of us knows this goal very well. And you were informed ahead of time that we are not coming here to solve some psychological issues or some sort of difficult internal problems, but that we came here for one thing. We want to unlock certain abilities, abilities that are related to a magical potential. In all times, similar activities were always accompanied by specific mysteries and secret ceremonies. A mystery is a certain process during which a person would go through a certain stage of their life. Something becomes revealed during these stages, something that one was unable to reveal before this day in their common everyday life. Before we come to an understanding of what we will be doing, I wanted to say a few words to remind you once again what magic is and what is that we are looking for. Those of you who have been my students for some time, including the General Theory of Magic course and the Novosibirsk group that just finished with the initiation process of the Major Arcana, all of you know that when we speak of magic, we first and foremost speak of knowledge. Knowledge that does not allow one to act incorrectly. To act incorrectly from the viewpoint of the system that has established here a certain life regime. The system has its own goal. The civilization is developing. The civilization is developing through the consciousnesses of people who are participating in some or other process, in some or other segment of time. These forces do not have a beginning nor an end. They are not bound by birth nor by death. These forces are informational potentials that we completely unnecessarily sometimes dress up in human form. And this gives us a distorted understanding. We call them gods but see them in a human form. Therefore, by picturing them in human form, we make a glaring mistake. We imagine that they will behave like people, think like people and act like people. Thus, we make them equal to us. And people live with a distorted worldview that one person is equal to another. People make a great amount of mistakes just due to this concept alone. They don't understand subordination and that people are not equal to one another, as terrible as it may sound from the viewpoint of the culture that we grew up in. Those selecting the path of magic should first and foremost learn this simple truth. An individual will be different from his fellow humans by the mere fact that he or she knows what they are doing while someone else just goes with the flow. The one who knows what they are doing can presume the consequences of their actions and assumes the path of magic or the path of ruling over other people. These are two branches, two branch offs. After some life events that make a person realize that they are different from everyone else, they make a decision to either follow the path of power or follow the path of magic. Those present here have chosen the second path. Additionally, those present here should clearly understand that witchcraft, common witchcraft, that we would come across in our cultural environment, and magic, are two vastly different concepts. First, because a warlock never knows what sort of force he is actually dealing with. He may think that he is using a force for his own miserly interests, thereby attaining love, wealth, fame and some other purely human life aspects, which are important to someone while they are human. But a warlock never even thinks that he himself is actually a method of manipulation, the source of manipulation for the force that is possibly helping him along his path. A person that has tasted sorcery's potential and has felt the power of sorcery is, as a rule, full of themselves, of their own significance. Sadly, there are a lot of people like that, because their potential for magic, as a foundation for the magical consciousness, is present in absolutely every person. A whole other story is that this potential is in sleep mode up to a certain point. It can stay dormant for one lifetime, two, five, ten, but eventually, when the existential volume of a person grows, along with their experience and power, as well as knowledge, that is, when the person becomes slightly different from others. 
But what needs to happen in a person's life for them to be different from others? Their life must become different from that of others. And usually, it is connected to certain adverse life events. Every single person present here, with a few exceptions among our youth, has experienced such an event, and possibly not just one. Experience an absolute disappointment in life, disappointment by prior life principles, principles that were given to them by the general population. And the general society did dictate, live this way, it is normal. You will be healthy, you will be successful, you will be loved, you will have it all, because that is what all people want. Do you remember the movie Moscow does not believe in tears? A Soviet cult classic. Remember the conversation between the main character and the girl? She asked him, so everyone wants to be a supervisor. Not everyone should be a supervisor, he says. Not everyone should, but everyone wants to. This is a classic snapshot of the worldview of that time. All should want the same thing. And if everyone wants the same thing, it is easier for the system to introduce tools that would either help people achieve or not achieve those same things. The system creates for people such a regime of existence in which they simply can't want anything different. For a person to change their worldview, it would take a total catastrophe, something that will wipe out their buddhic body. That person would say, all these values, they don't just not support my life, they destroy it. And then a person begins to think about the next stage of their life. What should I do with my values and beliefs? Although not everyone does this, some do forget that catastrophes took place in their life. They try not to remember, they try to live like the rest of people, focusing on the positives and living in the present. Social opinion helps them do that, as well as psychological literature, this new trend of focusing on the light. This is something that started not that long ago, about 20 years back when the flood of literature of the near christian thought rushed in. It was telling us that people should not strive towards anything. One should just live. This common phrase that you most likely have read before or heard around, live for the sake of life, sounds familiar? You've come across this message and surely have tried living according to this doctrine, to live for the sake of life. Did it work? I assume that it didn't work that well, or you wouldn't be sitting here. Living for the sake of life, it is some kind of vegetative existence. And possibly, at some point, every one of you realized that it was too little, that it wasn't enough. So you decided to follow a completely different path. I will tell you right away that this path is the most difficult one. It would be easier to become the president of the Russian Federation than to become a full-fledged magus. Because the obstacles that the presidents would come across cannot, even in the slightest, compare to the ones that will arise before a person facing trials on this particular path, in this sphere. Because the president can allow themselves to have some human weaknesses, isn't that right? A president is merely a person. They can allow themselves the right to make mistakes. Even though they may rule over other people, the president is just a person. And no one would fault them for being human. Moreover, the human position is, on the contrary, even encouraged. The one who follows the path of magic must refuse, fundamentally refuse, falling back on their human nature or make an excuse out of it. Thereby, as terribly as it may sound, but it is precisely the primitive human nature that to Amagus becomes enemy number one. I must emphasize, primitive, such as eating, sleeping, procreating, allowing oneself weaknesses, allowing tantrums, allowing oneself emotions that work-wise would be absolutely unnecessary. This is the first thing that you will come across since you have already selected this path, taming one's human animalistic desires. What it is going to look like, everyone will decide for themselves. But since you have found yourself on this path, you would have to make it to some logical end. I cannot say that you have to make it until the very end, but to a certain logical end. For these reasons, in all times, whether 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 2,000, or 40,000 years ago, these rituals existed that are called the mysteries. Only the distant echoes of mysteries have made it to our days. 
absolute echoes that were somehow described. I emphasize, they were only somehow described. Because the first rule of participating in a mystery is to never disclose its essence to anyone.